Welcome, fellow Toastmasters. I don't see any guests today to this meeting of online presenters. It has begun. Now, guests, please note that in order to be a member of our club, you must be a current or former active member of Toastmasters International and have completed at least six Toastmasters International speeches. Or alternately, if you have substantial relevant presentation experience, you may apply for membership after demonstrating your abilities in a two to three minute speech delivered during one of our club meeting. All requests for membership are subject to approval by the members of our club. If you have not already done so, please change your panel to ensure that it shows your name and role. If you have one, right click, select rename and do so. We have members and guests from many countries throughout the world. Thus, as a professional organization, we ask that you please be aware of language or words usage that may be considered offensive or otherwise insensitive due to cultural differences. Please note that we will be recording this meeting. Your video and audio contribution may be used for club marketing purposes. Also, please remain O-N-M-U-T-E, not U-N-M-U-T-E, when you're not speaking. He is on a cruise, giving out the best advice on where to go, how, why, and that's how you apply your Toastmasters training. You get to get this, see the world for free, just talking. Well, today we have him as our president, though on the ship, I do believe he's known as the man with the info. Help me welcome our president, Grant Hart. Yay! Thanks very much, uh, Madam Sergeant at Arms. Hello, everybody. My name is Graham Cairns. We all know me, so I don't need to go through all this stuff. But hey, welcome along. I am on a cruise ship. Uh, I am actually in a cabin on a cruise ship, as you can see, uh, with mirrors behind me and mirrors behind that. No, you don't want to see all this. We're actually currently sailing along towards the Great Australian Bight, that's B-I-G-H-T, not B-I-T-E, although it does look like somebody has taken a Great Australian Bight out of the uh, Great Australia. But anyway, we're on a cruise ship, so if the audio, is the audio working okay for you, by the way? You can hear me and all that stuff? Sure, it's not breaking up? It's breaking it up a little. a little, little garbled. You, you, you uh, sound like you're speaking underwater. So hopefully the ship is above the water. <laughs> the ship certainly is above water, yes. Uh, well, given that I'm speaking, this could be fun today. Anyway, be that as it may, uh, welcome everybody and let's get this meeting underway. Let me hand control of the meeting to our Toastmaster of the day. Why, Sorry, thank you, Mr. President and good evening, fellow Toastmasters. I'm pretty excited to be in charge of the meeting today because the topic or the theme is leadership. And that is one of the things that I happen to love to talk about. So I thought I would give you a little bit of leadership tips throughout the meeting. Uh, one of the things I wanted you to think about was when we were small, there was a game called follow the leader. Did anyone ever play that game? There was somebody who stood in the front of the line, everyone lined up behind them and did whatever that first person did. And that was our idea of leadership way back then. And really, if that was the case these days, that would be terrible. That would be just, you know, a disaster. There's a gentleman named Tom Peter who said, the best leaders don't create more followers, they create more leaders. The best leaders empower their people to make decisions, to make mistakes, as long as they learn from them, and they, they encourage autonomy, and they recognize potential and guide people so they can use that potential. They create a safe space for people to grow. One of the most important qualities for a leader is humility. And why is that? Because I personally believe that those who pursue power should never have it because they want to like boss people around and we don't want that kind of leadership. That never really works. Good leaders work at being a good leader. They continue to learn and grow and they serve their people. Now I'm not going to go in and explain about what our meeting is tonight because there's no guests here tonight. So I'm not going to go through the roles uh, separately, 
but I would like to introduce our tip of the day, who is Carolina Ramirez, and she is talking about how to lead Gen Z. So what a perfect topic for tonight's theme. Please welcome Carolina. Good afternoon, fellow Toastmasters. <laughs> Sorry. As leaders, managers have always been tasked with the responsibility of motivating and driving their team members to achieve success. However, this challenge has become especially pronounced in recent years as more Gen Zers enter the workforce. Gen Z, also known as the I generation, are individuals born between the mid-1990s and the mid-2000s. They are digital natives who grew up with technology and social media, and they have unique expectations, values, and preferences that differs from those previous generations. According to a recent survey conducted by one poll, Nearly 75% of managers said that Gen Z is more difficult to work with than other generations. Moreover, 12% of managers said that they fired a Gen Z employee in their first week of work. And being too easily offended is often to blame. To effectively lead Gen Z employees, managers must possess certain key leadership skills. Here are five skills that managers must improve to lead Gen Z employees. Let's check these five skills. The first one is coaching and mentoring. Gen Z employees want managers who can guide and mentor them to develop their skills and reach their career goals. Managers must be able to provide ongoing coaching and support to help their Gen Z employees succeed. This involves actively listening to their employees, feedback and concerns, providing regular feedback and giving them the resources they need to excel. The second skill is flexibility. Gen Z employees value flexibility and autonomy in their work. Managers must be willing to adjust their management style to accommodate their employees' needs and preferences. This includes offering flexible work arrangements, such as remote work, for instance, and being open to new ideas and ways of working. The third skill, or the third thing, thing you can offer is technology savvy. These employees are digital natives who grew up with technology. They expect their workplaces to be tech savvy and innovative. Managers must be comfortable with technology and be willing to invest in the latest tools and resources to help their employees be productive, productive and efficient. Fourth, inclusivity and diversity. These employees value diversity and inclusivity in their workplace. They want to work in an environment that is respectful and accepting of, of all individuals, regardless of their background or identity. Managers must promote inclusivity and diversity in their workplace. The fifth is transparency, transparency and communication. These employees value transparency and honesty in the workplace. They want their managers to communicate openly and honestly about company goals, expectations, and challenges. Managers must be transparent and honest in their communication to build trust and foster a culture of transparency. Summarizing, managers need five skills, or these are the main skills, in order to lead successfully Gen Z employees. Coaching and mentoring, flexibility, technology savvy, inclusivity and diversity, and transparency, transparency and communication. I hope this tip of the day is useful for you, or was use, useful for you. Mr. Master, back to you. 
That is very valuable information, Carolina. Thank you. I've done a lot of research in my job as an HR professional uh, on generations in the workplace, and each generation has different value that they bring to the table, and they have different needs and wants. And it's really quite an interesting thing when you look back at what drives each generation. If anyone ever wants to talk about it, I love these kind of topics, so please give me a call. Uh, next up, we have our first speaker of the day, and that is our fearless leader, Graham Cairns, DTM. Engaging humor, level three, increasing knowledge. Engage your audience with humor is a five to seven minute speech. Is this thing on? Graham Cairns has just been named as the winner of his Toastmaster area humorous speech contest, meaning he will go on to compete against the best speakers from 35 clubs in his Toastmaster division. So today he's taking this opportunity to practice his speech and hoping to introduce some more elements that will resonate across different cultures. And Jim Barber will be evaluating him tonight. Please welcome Graham with his speech. Is this thing on? Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, it is 46 years ago this month that I was given my first job in radio. Now, I know that's hard to believe. I mean, I'm not 46 years old. I can't be, can I? Yes, I can. But 46 years ago, I got my first job in radio. It was at a station called 4LG in Longreach. Now, Longreach is a small town in outback Australia. It's not the end of the world, but you can see the end of the world from there. And things have changed a bit in those 46 years. We used to play records, you know, big black round things that spin around. And the commercials used to be played off cassette. These days, it's all done digitally from computers. But some things haven't changed in the 46 years since I first started. And one of those is that the new kid always gets the gig that nobody else wants. In my case, it was Ranch Club. Two hours of country and Western request music. Now, now I know the difference between country and Western and just plain country music. But then I had no idea. I just played the requests as they came in. The first song that I ever played on air was The Singing Kettles, an Australian version of a Cal Smith classic called Air Mail to Heaven. I'm sending this letter to heaven. I'm sending it to your new home up above. Daddy, I hope you'll forgive her. I'm sending this air mail with love. It was dog's vomit. It was, in fact, a terrible, terrible song. It was followed by a local guy, Slim Dusty, the biggest disappointment in the family was me. And I knew exactly how he felt. And then Johnny Chester, who was another Aussie who had lonely women make good lovers, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> the fact that I can still remember those three songs 46 years ago tells you how deeply traumatised I was. But as I say, the new kid got the shift that nobody else wanted. That was one of the things that hasn't changed. Something else that hasn't changed in those 40 odd years of radio are funeral announcements. You see, in small country towns where the local newspaper may only come out once a week, if they even still have a newspaper, people can die and be buried long before their friends even know that they're gone. And so radio stations step in to fill the gap with funeral announcements. They go something like this. We now pause to offer our condolences before reading the following funeral announcement. The relatives and friends of the late Fred Nurk are respectfully invited to attend his funeral, which will take place at St. Zacchaeus the Tax Collector Church in Eagle Street, Longreach, for internment this afternoon at 2 p.m. in the Longreach Cemetery. And while that's being read, there's this organ musing music playing underneath it's sort of like the the phantom of the opera version but the claude rains one nye, 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 and you know you read all these announcements and then then of course you fade out the organ music at the end and you've got to go to something nobody wants their product advertised next to dead people so you can't go to an ad instead you have to go to music and i've heard some 
singularly inappropriate songs played at this point. The Bee Gees, wah, 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 staying alive, staying alive, or heaven must be missing an angel, or up, up and away, or worst of all, I fell into a burning ring of fire. Well, I never actually made that mistake. I did come close, though. I came perilously close one day. I, I just read a funeral announcement for this particularly crabby old biggie. You know, the sort of woman that people only turn up to the funeral just to make sure she's gone. You know the type? Well, I just read this funeral announcement. I was perhaps half a second away from starting the song when I realised that I was about to play Ding Dong, the witch is dead, witch old witch, the wicked witch. Ding Dong, the wicked witch is dead. <clears throat> Let's just say the audience got a slightly longer than pause, a slightly longer than normal pause at this point while they waited while I queued up another record. But I did dodge that bullet. Didn't mean that I didn't make mistakes. See, one of the things about being a young guy working away from home for the first time is that preparation's not normally high on the list of things that you do. And so I'd go to work to do an air shift at night without taking along any dinner. I mean, it wasn't a real problem. You just put on a long song and go down to the Boomerang Cafe, which was only a few doors down the street. And one night I put on the longest song I could find. It was the Credence Clearwater Revival album version of Heard It Through the Grapevine. 11 minutes and 43 seconds. Plenty of time to go down and grab a burger and come back and open the studio door and notice. And remember, this is back in the days when we were playing them off records, big black turntable spinny things. I walked back into the studio to discover that about 30 seconds after I'd left, it had hit a scratch. And so for four and a half minutes, all the audience had heard was heard it through it, 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 heard it. Embarrassing. But not as embarrassing as this one last story from my time at 4LG Longridge. I'm sitting at the desk. The, I'm getting ready to read the news at 7.30 in the morning. The DJ is on the other side of the desk. He's introducing a song, and he made a complete and utter dog's breakfast of it. It was a mess. He just completely stuffed it up, threw his headphones off, looked at me and said, Jesus Christ, I... I just pointed over his shoulder at the on. He looked at it, looked at me, went, oh... Bleep, and then turned the microphone off. Now, I mentioned that not to him, although he doesn't work in radio anymore. Well, he does, but only in installing car radios. But I, I mentioned that merely to tell you this. We didn't get a single complaint, not a phone call, not a letter, not a, an email. Well, there weren't any emails in those days. We're talking a long time ago. He didn't even get a telex. Nobody ever commented on it. Well, it's one of two things. Either nobody was listening, and given that it was 7.30 in the morning in the middle of the week, so that seems extremely unlikely, or they were just so used to this sort of thing happening that they thought, yeah, it's just another day at 4LG. And quite frankly, Madam Time Kermain of Toastmaster, I'm not sure which of those is more depressing. Well, thank you, Graham. That was really, that was funny. That was a good job. Yeah, let's see. He looks like he made it in his time. Um, Andy, was that on time? 7.21. Woo, perfect. All righty. Well, we have a second speaker today, and that would be our founding president, Mr. David F. Carr. And I have no idea what he's talking about. Because <laughs> he didn't really give me a description, even though I asked him. So it's on you, Dave. Come on. Everyone, welcome, David. Thank you, Marianne. I, I thought I mentioned at least briefly that I would be talking about one year of Twitter post Elon Musk taking the reins. Now, some of you may not have been obsessing over this saga as much as I have, but, but I've been watching it closely over the last year, uh, partly because I work for a company called Similarly that does web metrics for all sorts of websites. So our main customers would be looking for comparisons of how they're performing versus their competitors. 
But one side effect of that is we gather information that's of interest to the news media, including how is Twitter doing? I recently published a blog, which is really my way of putting stuff out the journalists are welcome to steal. And it said that Twitter was down by every measure except for traffic to Elon Musk's personal profile and tweets, which was up about 100% year over year. The actual business of the company is mostly governed by people going to ads.twitter.com. And you might have heard that it's been renamed, right? It's, it's, it's X now. We're supposed to call it X. We're not supposed to call it Twitter. But it's still ads.twitter.com because they've got the run to actually technically changing uh, that setup and redirecting people to a new domain. Although Elon owns X.com, it's apparently a decades-long obsession going back to when he was at PayPal uh, with X, you know, he's an X-rated guy. What can I say? But traffic to ads.twitter.com is down about 16% year over year. Traffic to twitter.com, the place that people would go to visit on the web, was down around 14% year over year. The usage of the app, at least in the U.S. where we have better metrics, is down about 16% year over year. So what has he accomplished? Well, if you don't remember the beginnings of the saga, in April of 2022, Elon Musk announced over out of nowhere that he wanted to buy Twitter. Apparently, he wanted to buy it partly so that he could reactivate Donald Trump's uh, account. Uh, although Trump has actually never come back to Twitter. He's been invited back. He tweeted exactly once. He tweeted his mugshot when he was arraigned a few uh, months ago because he is trying to fundraise off of that. So that was something that he wanted to get out and reach a wider audience. But Elon announced that he would pay $44 billion for a uh, you know, mediocre performing uh, social network uh, that was a little bit at sea already. And then a few months later, he decided, well, actually, he didn't, he didn't want to buy it because it was, it, was, it was overrun by bots. Most of the audience was actually bots, and how could he? How, it wasn't worth that much. But they took him to court, and eventually he was realized he might lose in court. And so just about a year ago today, well, a little bit later this month, Elon walked into Twitter headquarters carrying a sink, just this big piece of porcelain, apparently only so he could tweet out, I own Twitter now, let that sink in. So for the sake of a pun, uh, he took control of the company. And, and what has happened since then? Well, this is the stuff that, that I share regularly on our blog. Not that many people actually go to the blog, uh, but this is the way that we as I say, put out information that journalists are welcome to share uh, in, in embedding their own articles. Uh, very often, the more professional organizations or the bigger organizations like the Wall Street Journal will ask me for a spreadsheet full of data so they can recreate the charts. Uh, but this is the blog version, and that's, it doesn't look like a, a precipitous drop, but over the course of the year, well, these are big numbers. 955 million fewer visits to the website in this September versus a year ago. Same kind of thing going on with the apps, as I mentioned. Now, Twitter is still a huge website. It is one of the biggest websites in the world. Uh, it is one of the most popular apps. So. You can do a lot of crazy things and still have it be huge. So in this chart of web traffic, uh, it's third among the social networks. It's you know, quite a bit behind Facebook, but not that far behind Instagram. Um, Instagram has been growing better for Meta owner, um, Facebook owner Meta lately than 
that Facebook itself has. And this is the, the standings on uh, mobile apps. Again, a little bit, little bit down in the standings, but still respectable. Well, here, here again, maybe this is the whole thing. I mean, there must be more ways to drive up traffic to your Twitter profile, but uh, there was this huge peak when he first took over. So this doesn't look that big, but this is, as I say, it's about 100% up. And so if, if, if the sole reason he took it over was to uh, attract attention to himself, he has done a terrific job. Now, I, I, I discussed this with you partly because I'm actually telling this story over and over and over again right now. Uh, I was on with somebody from the BBC earlier today, and so I may get a few minutes of TV fame uh, if he got anything useful out of that Zoom interview. Uh, but definitely uh, looking from many different angles. The other thing that I've worked with the media a lot on is Twitter in particular was known as being a newsy social network. It's where people would go to find out what was happening, say with the Black Lives Pro protest, Black Lives Matters protest, they would get the tweets from people who were on the scene at a protest or, or whatever. Uh, they would get that before it made it into the, the mainstream media. Uh, but Elon's Musk and, and uh, Twitter's relationship with the media has kind of died off over the years. And this is declining traffic for Twitter. And, and the same thing is also happening with Facebook is it is a less reliable source of traffic for news sites. Uh, and so what was his purpose? Well, if it was to drive up traffic to his personal homepage, he's done a great job. Mr. Mr. Toastmaster, or Ms. Toastmaster, excuse me. Well, thank you so much, David. Uh, I don't really know too much about Twitter or X, whatever it is, but uh, that was very informative. Thank you so much. Now, we do have a little bit of extra time here, so I'm going to ask everyone here to put what they think are the most important qualities for a good leader in the chat. Because I'd like to see what you think about that. Um, oh, we got some good ones. Empathy, trust, respect, patience. Now, the sad thing is that in reality, a lot of leaders don't have these qualities and a lot of companies are suffering because of it. Now I uh, coach some people who are, you know, trying to be good leaders. And one of the, my questions that I always ask them is what do you know about your people? Tell me some things about your staff. And strangely, some people don't really know very much about the people who report to them every day. So usually my first homework assignment is to have a coffee with them and find out what's important to them, learn about their family. Because if you're a leader and you really don't care about the people, you're not gonna have them around very long. And I think uh, post COVID, a lot of people recognize the fact that they want to be somewhere where people care about them. So a lot of people, there was a big exodus there at that point because they felt that way. So I really like what I'm seeing from everybody because those are all very, very important. Now I'm gonna move along to table topics. Now, Mr. Mike Woodall, DTM is ready for us with table topics and I'm sure he is going to keep us entertained for the next few minutes. All right, thank you, Mary Ann. This, this is the first time I turned my mute off in advance instead of people yelling at me. I'm so proud of myself. On September 12th, 1962 in Houston, Texas, John F. Kennedy stood in Rice Stadium and declared to the world, we're going to the moon. We choose to go to the moon 
not because it is easy, but because it is hard. When he spoke these words, he empowered engineers from all over the country to design a spacecraft that did not currently exist. He spoke it into existence. JFK stood in a vision of a future possibility. While standing there, he came back to the present to empower others to stand in that future possibility with him. This, my friends, to me, is the epitome of leadership. Karthika, who stands out to you as an example of leadership? I wasn't expecting though. Okay. For me, when I when I think about leadership, it's Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, it's not because he's born in India, it's because of his principles that he took to drive the whole nation, which was like apart in many sense, not only culturally by language or by or by the way that people are uh, separated throughout uh, the life that they were leading since uh, the birth of Mahatma Gandhi. It's because he was torn apart in a foreign nation that drew him to understand his own countrymen and also uh, understood the value of empowering people of their own, of his own country. He came back to India he understood the sing, every single aspect of uh, the difficulty that they were undergoing, and which made him to inculcate, engage himself completely with the people, live with them, for them, and got them up to fight against every single evil that was happening to the people of India. So if I think about leadership, it's Mahatma Gandhi for me. Over uh, to you. Thank you, Kritika. Gandhi is one of my uh, epitomes of leadership also. Uh, Carolina, what are the characteristics of a great leader? My Thank you for the question. I think that are the things that I mentioned before when I was talking about the tip of the day. New generations are coming and you need to have some key leadership skills like flexibility. Uh, you need to be a, a coach or a mentor for the people you are leading. It's not enough to control the people, but you need to motivate and empower the people who are who are working with you. And you need to be someone who wants to work with technology because the new generations want to be related with technology in their works. And Oh, I forgot the last two. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, especially you need to be respectful with the people you are leading because the, the people you are leading maybe have many expectations about, about you and about how you are going to be helping their career or covering their expectations. And you need to have empathy for the people you are leading as well, because maybe people can have problems at home or in their personal lives. And as Marianne said, you need to know about the about some facts or about the life of people you are leading. Those are the key, the key characteristics I think a leader has to have in order to empower their their team back to you mike all right thank you carolina joni we all have thoughts about our future potential and some can actually visualize themselves in that future possibility 
I'd like for you to stand in the vision of your future self, the self you are yearning to become. Come back to the present moment while standing there and empower us to stand there with you. I'm her. Most people would think that some me off in the future is what I would hope to be, but I live that person every day. There was a time when I didn't feel empowered and empowerment was the last thing on my mind. I did have to stand and think, where do I want to be in the future? But it wasn't about the job or the home. It was about the inner peace, the self-confidence, the empowerment as a person. Most of the time, we spend our time trying to get yeses from others, to fit in with the group, not asking ourselves what would make us feel empowered. What do I need to be a better version of me, even if nothing around me ever changes? It was listening to little me, me from the past, me who looked up and said, when I want to become a certain age, this is what I want to be that was bright eyed and full of hope. That somewhere along the years, that flame of motivation got snuffed out. Most people go to 60 year old them and say, what were your regrets? What didn't you do? And then they spend the time trying to chase and catch to get to 60 to say I did miss. I've learned that a lot of the times it's better to go sit with the you that you used to be and ask, where did all that passion for life go? Where was all that joy and all the things that you believed that you could do? Where did that go? And the second you find that, no matter the direction the wind blows and life takes you, you'll remember that little wide-eyed, innocent boy, girl, other, that you used to be, who was empowered to do and become. Back to you. Barbara. All right. Thank you, Joni. Jim Barber. How does a leader empower others to jump on board the train? The one that's leading toward a possibility worth having. Thank you, Mr. Topics Master. How does a leader empower others to jump on the train? There are so many ways not to do it. Telling them to do it guilting them into doing it, shaming them into doing it, threatening them into doing it. There's so many ways that don't work. The way to do it, though, using the analogy that you just said of, of catching the train, is showing them the train and making them want to get on the train. If they want to get on the train... You don't have to do anything. They're going to do their very best to get on the train. So it's a matter of persuasion more than anything else. Clarification and persuasion. Clarification to make sure that they share your vision. What is it that you want to accomplish? If they understand that, you've got your halfway there. If they don't understand that, it really doesn't matter what you're going to do. They're going to be at a they're going to be at a complete loss. Even if they want to help, if they don't know what you're shooting for, it's kind of like as David described with X used to be Twitter. I don't think people know what he has in mind, so they don't know how to follow him. First step then is to make sure that people understand your vision and share your vision. Once they do that, then 
get them on board, make them want to catch that train. If they want to catch the train, they will. They'll do everything in their power to get on board. You don't have to persuade them. You don't have to tell them how to do it or anything like that. You just have to make them want to get on board. And to make them want to get on board, you have to understand what they want and what they need. So it comes back to them. If you understand what they want and they need, and you can show them that they can get that by wanting your vision, you're there. That's it, Mr. Topics Master. Thank you, Jim Barber. Antoinette, when was the last time you were empowered by a leader? Unmute yourself. Go. Yes, good evening to my fellow Toastmasters. And such an interesting question. I have been working in a financial institution for over 28 years. There have been many managers that I worked under as the admin professional. However, there was this one man who was, who was very authoritative to most of us. But somehow, like she has a, a, a spot for me. And she would not be very rough. Be very rough. I would be able to do so many things without even asking her or requesting permission from her, unlike, the, uh, unlike my other colleagues. As a matter of fact, when they approach her, they'll say, I don't know if she's in a good mood today. And I would say, yeah, man, she's in a good mood. But that particular manager, she empowered me because one, she knew her work, that's one. Secondly, she was very thorough. And you have to dot your I's and cross your T's. So during her tenure, I was able to grow in my field under her tenure. She only spent roughly about seven years with us, out of all the matches, and there were about 10 of them, with very short stints, this particular manager really empowered me, and she is what I am today. Back to you, Table uh, Topics. Thank you, Antoinette. Uh, do we have one, time for one more, Marianne, or is that it? All right, there we go. Andrew Byrne. In my opening, I use an example of John F. Kennedy. We're going to the moon. What tactics? What? What was? How did he empower others uh, to jump on that train and to get on that vision? You'll have to unmute yourself. Thank you very much for that question. I think when I look back over that time period, I was about 10 years old at that time of that speech, I remember it clearly. I think about some movies that reflected on that time. And the one movie that comes to mind that emotionally touched me was Apollo 13. And during that movie, you saw how they approached problems. You had a democratic approach with a leader on top of that. So for example, when they had the problem of the carbon dioxide building up in the cabin that could have killed them, everybody in the engineering group was brought into a room 
and they said, you need to solve this problem. They went into the backups of what they had, of what was in that room, and they said in this line to everybody, this is the problem that we've gotten from up top, and we have to solve this. We have to fix this, make something that fits in a round hole from a square peg, and we have to do this with just this. And he put out everything that was on board the ship to do that. That was the quintessential point, in, in my view, of how you're gathering people and have them jointly solve a problem. And I think that that's what his speech encouraged everybody to do. Put a problem and a vision and encouraged everybody to solve that problem. Thank you very much, Table Topics Master. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, Graham, for jumping in this timer. Madam Toastmaster, Marion Grady, thank you for this opportunity to be your Table Topics Master. You all, you did an excellent job, Mike. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate when you come in with the theme on your questions. So terrific job tonight. We're getting to learn a lot about everybody's leadership thoughts. I love that. <laughs> now, one of the things um, that there's a difference between like a boss and a leader. And I always say that bosses are always caring about the results. And while that's an important thing, I believe that a leader cares about the people and then the results will take care of themselves. So I think there's, it's just a little bit different way of looking at it, but the ones who care only about the results, it's sometimes at the cost of the people and they don't feel appreciated and they don't, they don't stay loyal and they tend to move along. So if you really wanna create that group that is tight knit and really loyal to the cause, it's really important that you show them that you care. Now, the final segment of our meeting is handled by our general evaluator, Ms. Kim Leeming. Uh, please welcome Kim, our general evaluator for tonight. Thank you very much, Toastmaster of the day, Marianne Grady. Fellow Toastmasters and dear guests, as Marianne mentioned, my name is Kim Leeming. It is my pleasure to be your general evaluator for tonight. My role is divided into two parts. Part one is to introduce the evaluators for the prayer speeches, and part two is to give my general evaluation of the overall meeting. Before we start with the evaluations, could I please ask the timer for today, I believe that's Andy, or it might be Graham, to remind us of the timing requirements for the evaluator speeches. Take it away, and your Graham, whoever it is. Thank you very much, Ms. General Evaluator. The evaluation segment of the meeting, which is one of the most important ones of the entire meeting, is a two to three minute segment of time. Green at two, yellow at 2.30, and red at three. I'll put it on the screen and keep you advised of where we're going. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Our first evaluator tonight is Andres Falenko. He will be evaluating speaker number one, David Carr. Please welcome Andre. Thank you very much, Madam General Evaluator. Uh, my fellow online presenters, I don't need to introduce you, David Carr. I don't need to tell you about his technical ability and his online presentation techniques, which are outstanding. In today's speech, he clearly demonstrates his expertise on quite an important question from his point of view. Has Twitter, which is a social network, benefited since Elon Musk has taken over the site? Or Elon Musk personally benefited, but not the Twitter users? When David starts, he starts in a calm and relaxing manner. In my view, that creates trust into professional who is really honest and 
doesn't cover any business, personal business interests when he provides analysis. What I like about David's speech that he took us through a, a little bit of journey, what happened before Elon Musk took over the Twitter and what happened during his reign. He provided us with convincing graphs, the numbers, the figures, and that was quite intense moments that I could follow as well. I really like the style, I really like the punchline, and to me, the David's idea about exposing Elon Musk, the famous billionaire, to perhaps showing that he's been using Twitter to his personal advantage, that was quite an important moment. At the same time, throughout the speech, I noticed a number of recommendations that I would like to share with David. The first recommendation is, even though we live in 2023, however, perhaps some of us, they don't use Twitter. Some of us need a gentle reminder who the Elon Musk is. So setting pieces on the board and naming the pieces, setting the scene, and just giving a bit of explanation, I think that would help us to follow your story even more. The recommendation number two, I would like to ask myself, even though it's all data correct, relevant, trust is created, what's in it for me? What am I going to do with all that information? How can I apply that information to my business blog or to my personal story or to the school that I run or perhaps my HR business? That little value, if you could add it, would make me engaged more in the story. Overall, I understand that it's your personal um, fascination, if you like, about the, your job that you do and about the numbers and figures you can provide and it's so free. You know, at the same time, I like the sense of humor that you use throughout your speech. Just with few little suggestions and if you want to take them into account, what's in it for me and setting up the pieces, your next speech perhaps uh, would be even greater than this. Back to you. Madam, a general evaluator. Thank you, Andre. Our second, ev uh, and thank you for a very precise and wonderful evaluation. Our second evaluator today is Jim Barber. He will be evaluating speaker number two, Graham Carnes. Please welcome Jim. Thank you, Madam General Evaluator, my fellow Toastmasters. I've got basically the same situation that Andre had in evaluating David's presentation in my evaluating Graham's presentation. You all know, everybody here knows what a master speaker Graham is. So I'm not going to bore you, but I am going to briefly touch on the things that I especially liked about his presentation. And I have one suggestion that I'll tell you at the end. Graham opened with, it was 46 years ago. That is the opening to a story. That is the that is probably the best opening to a speech you can have. I love that sort of opening. It, it was 46 years ago. But then you closed with, and finally, Madam Toastmaster, I'm not sure which is more depressing. Great closing. It was a summary of what came along, but it's not the same old thing of in summary, da, da, da. No, this was very, very well done. In between, well, let's see, gestures, you put your hand to your ear when you were talking, when you were imitating being on the radio. That was very good. And of course, your other gestures, they were congruent with what you were saying, natural, flexible, everything was great. Verbal, of course, you are a master. I love your vocabulary, your pacing, the, the speed at which you speak. Some of the things that I jotted down, it was dog's vomit. Descriptive, I like that. Singularly inappropriate, love that combination. Particularly crabby old bitty. All right. And oh, big black 
big black round spinny things. I'm a sucker for technical vocabulary. I love that. Anyway, everything was great. I have one suggestion for you. This was, I believe, a con a preparation, a practice for a contest speech. Ah, and so you probably already know what's coming along. You timed in at 721. Now, David was disqualified because he went over 730. You came dangerously close to doing that. If you're going to be presenting as you were tonight uh, to a an online audience, you, you might be able to get away with that. But if you are speaking to a group of people, live people, of course, you're going to get laughter from your presentation. You don't want to step on your own laughter. So you need to pause and you don't have any room to put any pauses in. Now, this is going to be painful because frankly, you need to get rid of about 45 seconds of the material. And I don't know what to tell you to get rid of because it was all great. But I do recommend that you do some ruthless editing, get rid of about 45 seconds. And if you'll do that so you don't have to worry about time, you have got a winner here. Congratulations, Graham. Back to you, Madam General Evaluator. Thank you, Jim. As always, a very masterful evaluation. I have to tell you, both your evaluators, I would not have wanted to bend your place because some of the best speakers in our club. Now, could I please call on our timer, Andy, to give us the evaluator's timer's report for tonight's evaluations. Take it away, Andy. It is in the chat. We have uh, Jim Barber at 3.15 and Andre at 3.19. Both qualified. Thank you, Andy. As you heard, both of tonight's evaluators qualified with the timing for their evaluations. So thanks in advance to everyone for casting your votes for best evaluator for tonight's meeting. If you haven't yet done so, then please also cast your vote for best speaker and best table topic. It is now time for the general evaluation portion of the meeting. Speaking of time, I will try to make this short. I will be using the empower method of evaluation, starting with E. E is for excellent evaluators, a big reason why online presenters are so successful in transforming speakers into even more competent and competent speakers is the empowering and actual feedback we all receive from our evaluators. Tonight was no exception. Andre and Jim each gave a unique and valuable feedback that the speakers and quite frankly, all of us can apply to our own speeches. I especially liked when Andre talked about how he felt when, when he heard what was saying and, and, and Jim as well. Next up is the letter M. M is for Marianne. Marianne Grady was Toastmaster of the day today. Marianne, you have a wonderful way of making our meetings fun and meaningful, while at the same time keeping the meeting very organized and on time. As always, awesome job tonight as Toastmaster of the day. If we could give you a permanent position here at Online Presenters, it should be Toastmaster of the day. The next letter is P. P is for professional. Although I know that this is an advanced Toastmaster club, each and every meeting still impresses me with the amount of professionalism everyone brings to their roles. This rings true for the speaking roles as well as every other role in our meeting. Thank you so much. And the next letter, this brings us to O. O stands for on time. Marianne and everyone here is doing an excellent job of keeping this meeting on time despite a pretty full schedule. O also stands for overachiever. I'd like to point out that our president, Graham Terrence, took time away from his cruise to speak at tonight's meeting. That's definitely above and beyond. And Graham, you are an online presenter's overachiever. The next letter is W. W stands for witty. This applies to tonight's table topics. Mike, you're an amazing table topics master. W for witty also applies to the table topic answers. Everyone did a great job. Next up is the letter E. E stands for extra value. 
In this case, I'm referring to the tip of the day, a relatively new addition to our meetings. I love that online presenters includes the tip of the day in our meetings. Carolina, you brought extra value to tonight's meeting with your empowering discussion of Gen Z. Our last letter for tonight's evaluation is R. R is for romancing the guests. Online presenters is grateful for all guests. I know we didn't have any tonight, but I'd like to say thank you to our recent guests who have turned into our newest members, both Farah Turudizia uh, and Gregory Bunjaks. We are planning to conduct the new member induction ceremonies for both of them at next week's meeting. As always, online presenters give thanks to our guests and looks forward to romancing the future guests. Next up is another exciting part of our evening. Our vote counter is going to reveal the voting results for our best speaker, best evaluator, and the, oh, here, Marianne. You're muted, Marianne. You still haven't called for the reports, the all counter, the chat monitor, watcher, and grammarian. Oh, I did not do that. Okay, so first up is our all counter report. Can the all counter please give their report for tonight? And I think that's Antoinette. Thank you, Antoinette. Yeah, sure. I was wondering that myself. Anyway, as a, before, is this is a professional club, as we all know. And just two persons then in excess of us, that was Marianne and David. They had in excess of three hours, which are fellow wits. And that's my brief report. Back to you. Thank you, Antoinette. Next up is our grammarian, who is I'm looking, I'm looking. That we Joni. Joni, Joni, can you please give your grammarian report? I can say that the use of language in this meeting was so empowering that I actually just could not choose specific highlights. So I'll just say we did good with how we spoke. Jim, did I get that one right? Did I say it right? Next, as it relates to the use of the word of the day, it was used over 12 times, multiple times by various speakers. And I know why our GE skipped everyone. It was because she wanted me to include the fact that the word of the day was taken to another level in conjugation with the GE's report. So not only did she use it, but she used it to make her report. Carolina used it. I used it. Jim used it. Antoinette used it. Mike used it. And maybe because it was used so much, I might have missed a few. But overall, great use of the word of the day or a conjugation of the same. Back to you, Madam General Evaluator. Thank you, Joni. Next up is our chat monitor, Kartika. Kartika, could you please give your report for tonight? Oh, definitely, Kim Laming, this master Kim Laming. We are truly empowered today with the empowerment information that has been shared in the chat. And Yoni, for your kind information, I have used the word empowerment right now. Okay, let me get in. Let me get into the chat monitoring aspect of today. We have shared about the leadership skills that is required by every one of us, and that is highlighted as empathy, trust, patience, decisiveness accepting responsibility, being humility, being hum uh, humility and being flexible. There are also aspects which has been shared about storytelling in presentation as well as service leadership. Please go and uh, download the fact which is going to be really helpful to you. And one last but not the least thing, the cute wallpaper cola, which is being posted by Andy. And thanks for the wallpaper, Andy. And over to you. Uh, Toastmaster Kim. 
Thank you, Kartika. And last but certainly not least is our watcher for tonight, Jim Barber. Could you please give us your report? Thank you, Madam General Evaluator, with pleasure. We are an advanced club, but more than that, we are online presenters. We all, we do it right. Everybody comes to the club to see how we do it. So everybody was just right on target. But I don't want to leave you with just that. I want to mention one thing in particular. Now, I am learning OBS Studio, so I'm not smooth at it yet. There we go. But it, it did show up. Carolina, I want to give her special kudos on her closing slide. This was so well done. Notice at the top of her slide, she had Generation Z, basically the title, more or less, of her presentation. Underneath that, she had a picture. We respond well to pictures of some Gen Z people. That was, again, good. She has over on the left of the slide, she has the five points that she was making. And, of course, she has herself at the very bottom of the screen so that she is a part of the slide itself that she is she is still the star of what's going on we know what's going on this is in my opinion one of the best closing slides that anybody has ever produced and i just wanted to make a special note of that congratulations carolina this was good everybody else everybody did fine we're we're advanced we're online presenters we are great Thank you, Jim. And thank you to you, Marianne, for pulling my head out. It's much brighter now to um, introduce all those reports. So now it is time for the drum roll, please, for the vote counter to announce the winners for tonight's meeting. Yes, we have winners. Best evaluator is Tim Barber. And Best table topics speaker is Carolina Ramirez. Best speaker, Graham Kearns. Congratulations to the winners. Back to you, Miss Journal Evaluator. Thank you so much, Carolina. And thank you to everyone for such a fun and wonderful meeting. And I'm going to hand the gavel back, the virtual gavel, back to our Toastmaster of the day, Mary Ann Grady. Well, thank you so much. Wonderful job, Kim, as always. And as we get ready to close out our meeting, I wanted to share another quality or another couple of qualities that I think are important for leaders. One is vulnerability. Uh, we have to let people know that we don't know everything. We don't have all the answers and, you know, be honest about that with them. It really is important in how they see you that you're more relatable and more real that way. Another thing is you must let people have ownership and responsibility for projects. And one of the things I want to let you know, there's a trick to that one, because when you do that and you let people take on more responsibilities so that they, a lot of managers fear that because they feel they'll be, they're going to be just as good as them. But in reality, when you let people take on higher level responsibilities, it frees you up to learn even higher level responsibility. So always be willing to bring people along with you, bring them along and we'll all do well. Now that's all I have for you tonight. So I will close out tonight's meeting and thank you all for being here. And I will give it back to, I guess, our Sergeant at Arms, who is our um, officer right now, right? I believe that the officer should be Kim, vice president membership, but it's fine. I'll take it and I will close out our meeting officially so we can get to who's going to do roles next week.